Our holy gospel this morning comes from the gospel of Matthew chapter 10. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them. For nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, and even the hairs of your head are counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be the member of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The good news of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a doozy of a gospel text that we have this morning. It's almost like somebody took a lot of things that we don't feel quite comfortable hearing, quite comfortable talking about, and they put them all right back to back to each other for us to hear this morning. We started off hearing about slaves and their masters, and not about freeing slaves, just talking about slaves. And then we heard about those who kill the body, and even worse, the one who has the power to kill body and soul in hell. And then we heard this verse, whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. And then this one, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And he describes the conflicts that will come in families before, because of his presence. And then finally he says, whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That's a heavy passage. And it's hard to hear that as anything other than threatening news, bad news, rather than gospel, rather than good news. That's what gospel means. It's difficult for us, if you're anything like me anyways, to hear a passage like that and not feel just at least a twinge of fear, a little bit of anxiety, maybe even guilt. If you're anything like me, you start thinking about yourself and how you measure up to those things Jesus is saying in this passage. You begin to wonder, have I taken up Jesus' cross? Have I followed him? Am I worthy of him? And if I haven't, then what does that mean for me? Or you wonder about the conflict in family that he says he will bring. And if you wonder if I haven't experienced that sort of conflict, if I haven't been kicked out of my house for my faith, what does that say about me? Or you hear about deny, that verse about denying him and you wonder maybe have I denied Christ with my actions or my inactions, with my words, or maybe with my silence. If you're anything like me, passages like this bring a twinge of fear, a twinge of anxiety. They make you worry a little bit about whether you're really measuring up as a disciple. The thing is, though, if you look at this passage carefully, you'll notice there's a theme that gets repeated. Three times in this passage, Jesus says the equivalent of fear not. Jesus says, have no fear of them. He says, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. And he says, do not be afraid, you are of much more value than many sparrows. Jesus seems to intend this as good news. And yet, for me anyways, and I would imagine for many of you, it strikes us as bad news or at least threatening news. 
I think when Jesus was speaking to his disciples when he first spoke these words, and when Matthew decided to include these words in his gospel for the church he was writing his gospel for, they heard these as good news, as words of comfort and peace, not words of accusation, not words of fear. You see, the people that these words were originally spoken to were people suffering under persecution. Those early disciples were about to be persecuted for their faith. The church that Matthew was writing for was probably a Jewish Christian church that had been fairly recently kicked out of the synagogue. They had been excluded from fellowship with the worshiping community they had always intended. Many of them perhaps had been made to leave their household because of their faith, because of their commitment to following this Jesus. When you hear these from a place of persecution, these words become words of comfort, not words of attack. When Jesus says something along the lines of, I have not come to bring peace but a sword, and he describes that family conflict, if you have been ostracized from your family for the faith, as those early disciples, many of them would have been, those are wonderful words to hear, that it doesn't mean Jesus has abandoned you. And when Jesus says, Whoever denies me before others, right before that, he says, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. And for those who risk their very lives to make that confession, those are words of comfort and peace. And when Jesus says, do not fear those who can kill the body but have no authority over the soul, what better words of comfort are though there for those who are being persecuted, for those whose very lives are at stake for their confession of faith? From a place of persecution, these words are words of comfort. The persecution seems very far from us here in Dawson, Minnesota. Persecution seems very distant. It's not that persecution has gone away. We have brothers and sisters all over the world who suffer persecutions at the hands of governments and authorities. There are people all over the world who for their faith have been ostracized from their communities, from their families, there are people all over the world who have been imprisoned and even killed for their faith. And yet that doesn't seem to be the case for us here today. In fact, our situation seems almost the exact opposite. If anything, it's easier to be a Christian than not to be a Christian in Dawson. Many of our families, at least for those of us here, many of our families have been Christians for generations, as long as anyone can remember. For most of us, the majority of our neighbors are Christians. Maybe they don't attend church regularly, but they still identify themselves as Christians, if you ask. To be Christian is the norm here. Most people are Christians, and it would be harder, actually, to not be Christian than to be Christian here. Our situation is exactly the opposite, and texts like this are hard for us to make our own. They're hard for us to hear because persecution seems to be such a distant thing from our lives. Now, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm pretty certain I have never been persecuted for my faith. I'm pretty certain I have never received persecution for being a Christian, but I don't know your stories. Maybe some of you have been persecuted, probably not in a life-threatening way, but maybe in a way that you were ostracized from your families, ostracized from your communities, that you were discriminated against for what you believe. If you have those stories, I would love to hear them. I, I would invite you to share those with me um, at some time. But I don't have those stories, and my guess is many of you probably don't either. So what do we do with a text like this? I wonder if the people of Dawson, Minnesota, aren't being persecuted, although in a very different way. Our persecution maybe doesn't come in the way of persecution for our faith, persecution for being Christians, but maybe persecution just for being human. You see, there is suffering all around us. Every day, people in this community and in every community are wounded. They're wounded physically, they're wounded spiritually, they're wounded emotionally. There are forces arrayed against us, evil forces, the forces of sin, the forces of death, and we feel the, uh, their effects on a daily basis. We here in Dawson are no strangers to tragedy. We're no strangers to suffering. 
We're no strangers to losing those who are close to us, to having broken relationships, to being unjustly mistreated by those who don't mean to, but don't know any better, it seems. We're no strangers to this sort of conflict. We're no strangers to the power of sin and death in our lives. And that's where Jesus' words to us in this text become so important. Because Jesus tells us in our gospel text to have no fear of them. Have no fear of them. Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. The list of things which can kill the body but cannot kill the soul is a long one. And we are told to have no fear of them. We are to have no fear of things like cancer, things like dementia, things like drug and alcohol abuse, things like domestic violence, things like accidents, like suicide, and many, many other things which can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. We are told to have no fear of these things because we have something greater than them. We have a God who became human who suffered and died, who was raised from the dead, and who ascended so that all things may now be placed at his feet. This God has given us a gift, and that is God's life-giving promise of love, of salvation, of the forgiveness of sin. We have no need to be afraid because all those things, whatever those things that you fear, those things that afflict you, they have no final authority over you. God has set us free from the powers of sin and death, and God has recruited us into his mission against these powers. We have been given his liberating promise, and now we get to use it to bring comfort to those in need of healing, to bring peace to those who are in the midst of struggles. Because we have no need to fear, we can do things and say things that would make us uncomfortable. Because we have no need to fear, we can take action against these forces. Action like our runners who are staying with us this weekend, who are running in order to help those who are in need in other parts of the world. Actions like reminding each other of God's promises to us when we most need it. Actions like telling others about God's and love and forgiveness for them when they find themselves in the midst of of their dark times, whatever those times may be. Do not be afraid, for your fears have already been defeated. Do not be afraid, for God knows you better than you know yourself. Do not be afraid, for your future has been secured. You have received God's promises to you, so do not be afraid. Amen.